In this video, I'll take a look at the KIM-1, an early single board microcomputer. We'll look at the history of the machine, its features and capabilities, and I'll demonstrate how the front panel is used to enter and run small programs. I'll say something about the history behind the unit I have and present some resources for more information. KIM-1, short for Keyboard Input Monitor, was a small 6502 microprocessor-based single-board computer developed and produced by Moss Technology, Inc. The company developed the 6500 series of microprocessors and created the KIM-1 as a proof of concept to demonstrate the new microprocessor and provide a development platform for it. Launched in 1976, it was sold as a single board for US $245. With that, users had to add a power supply and a cassette tape recorder and or a serial terminal or teletype and paper tape reader and punch for mass storage. The unit came with the following manuals, the MCS6500 Programming Manual, MCS6500 Hardware Manual, KIM-1 User Manual, KIM Hints, a 6502 Programming Card, and the KIM-1 Schematic Diagram. A user community grew up around the computer and resulted in a number of books such as the first book of Kim edited by Jim Butterfield as well as a number of magazines. Moss Technology was later acquired by Commodore, known for such computers as the VIC-20, Commodore 64 and the Amiga series. The 6502 microprocessor was used in many early computers, not just the Commodore machines, but also the Apple II series, Atari, Acorn, and the original Nintendo game console. The KIM-1 paved the way for later computers with video displays and full keyboards like the Commodore PET and Apple II, which eventually led to the personal computers that we use today. The KIM-1 is a single printed circuit board that only needs a power supply for basic operation. The processor is a 6502 CPU running at 1 MHz. It's not socketed. To be original, it should be an MCS6502 made by Moss Technology in a white 40-pin ceramic dip package. Many other vendors made 6502 processors, and in fact a CMOS version, the 65CO2, is still manufactured by Western Design Center and can run it up to 14 MHz. The other two 40-pin chips are MCS6530 RAM I.O. Timer or Riot chips. These each contain 1K, 1024 bytes of masked ROM, 64 bytes of RAM, two 8-bit bidirectional I.O. ports, and a programmable interval timer. All of the firmware, a total of 2K or 2048 bytes, is contained in these two chips. Each of the chips is unique in that the code in the masked ROM is different. The source code for the firmware is listed in the KIM-1 manual. Also on the board is 1K, 1024 bytes of RAM consisting of eight 6102 static RAM chips. The total RAM in the machine is therefore this 1024 bytes plus 64 bytes in each of the two Riot chips for a total of 1152 bytes. These six seven-segment LEDs provided the display, which was typically used to show a 16-bit address and 8-bit data in hexadecimal. All seven segments of the LEDs can be controlled in software, so it's possible to display crude alphanumeric characters. There's a 24-key calculator-type keypad providing hexadecimal number keys 0 to 9 and A to F, as well as keys labeled Go, ST, RS, AD, DA, PC, and Plus. There's also an SST slide switch. I'll describe shortly how these keys are used by the firmware. On the left side are gold-plated fingers that accept 44-pin edge connectors shown here. Most signals of interest are brought out to these connectors, most notably the power supply connections, cassette tape interface, two serial interfaces, and the I.O. ports of the 6530 chips. The lower connector was referred to as the application connector and the upper as the expansion connector. One of the 6530 chips has its I.O. ports dedicated to the display, keyboard, tape, and serial I.O. The other is free for the user to use. 
Note that the serial ports use a 20 milliamp current loop interface used by teletypes of the era, but not RS-232. They can be converted to RS-232 levels with some additional circuitry. A number of expansion boards were offered for the KIM-1, including memory and peripherals for input and output. A minimal setup requires a 5-volt power supply. A 12-volt supply is only needed for using the cassette interface. Let's look at entering and running a small program using the keyboard and display. From power on, we need to hit the RS or reset key to reset the CPU and start the firmware monitor. The left four digits of the display show a memory address in hexadecimal. The right two show the contents of that address. By default, we're in address mode where we can key in an address with the hex keypad. Pressing DA or data goes into data mode and allows entering data at that address. Pressing AD goes to address mode and allows entering an address again. The plus key in either mode advances to the next address. The SST switch controls whether the computer free runs or single steps one instruction at a time. When SST is set to on, the machine is in single step mode, otherwise it free runs at full speed. Pressing go starts execution from the currently displayed address, either free running or single stepping based on the SST switch position. Pressing ST or stop will stop execution and return to the monitor. It uses the non-maskable interrupt line to interrupt the processor. In order for single step and stop to work, you need to store the monitor's NMI vector address in RAM by writing to two data bytes, 17FA with data 00, zero and 17FB with data 1C. When a program is single stepped or stopped, the machine context is stored in addresses EF through F5. This includes the values of all the CPU registers. One of these is the program counter, and hitting the PC key will set the current address to the value saved in the machine context, which makes it easy to resume stepping after examining memory locations. Let's look at a simple example of a small program in machine language. We'll just execute a few representative instructions and loop forever. Here's the assembly language code for it. We could easily assemble this by hand, getting the following listing with addresses and machine language code. Or for ease of entering the data, here's just the list of addresses and data bytes we need at each address, starting at 0200. Let's enter it. And now double checking our work by reviewing it again after it's been entered. EA A9 zero one A2 zero two A zero zero three four C zero 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 two. By entering the start address zero two hundred and pressing go, the program will start executing and loop forever. If we press stop, it will stop and return to the monitor. We can look at the machine context that was saved when it was running by examining these addresses. EF 
is the program calendar low, program calendar high, status register or flags, stack pointer, accumulator, Y register, and X register. If we move the ST switch to the on position, we can single step the program. Now when we run from address 0 to 100, it will step one instruction at a time. showing the address and data for the instruction. The context is also saved and available to be examined in bytes EF through F5. Pressing PC will set the address to the value of the program counter that was saved. Single stepping can be slow, so another debugging technique is using breakpoints. If you want breakpoints to stop and jump into the monitor, you also need to write to these two locations, 17FE, with the same data as before, 00 and 1C. To insert a breakpoint into a program, you just enter a break instruction, which has hex code 00, at the desired location. When the break instruction is encountered, it will save the machine context and go into the monitor. IRQ or interrupt also uses the same vector, so interrupts will go there too. Kim1 users soon get into the habit of initializing the four NMI and break bytes whenever the machine is powered up. As an example of a larger and more interesting program, here's one which uses the timers to turn the Kim1 into a clock which displays the current time on the display. This one is 85 bytes long, so I won't force you to watch me enter all the data. I'll enter it and come back. Okay, I've now entered the code. Address 60 contains the hours. 61 holds the minutes. And 62 the seconds. Then we can start at address 0200. And as expected, it shows a time starting at 12 o'clock with hours, minutes, and seconds. With only the built-in keyboard, display, and monitor, you can enter and run programs. This gets a little tedious after a while. You can also operate the machine from the serial port and load and save programs over a second serial port or cassette tape interface. I plan to cover that in future videos. This unit was generously given to me by Robert Ford Dennison, who's known for writing 2KSA, a symbolic assembler that fit in 2K of memory and ran on the Kim 1. He developed it on this machine, which also had a RAM expansion to 4K, an external keyboard, but only the Kim 1 display for output. The board is all original and does not appear to have had any modifications made to it. It's a Rev B board, which is quite early. The Kim 1 design went up to at least revision F. There's a QA stamp with a date code of 7646, indicating manufacture in the 46th week of 1976. The ICs, including the CPU, have date codes from 1976, as well as the 6502 and 6530 riot chips. The RAM chips were also made by MOS technology. Early versions of the 6502 had a bug in the rotate write instruction. Some well-known software, including Microsoft Basic, had to avoid using this instruction. The bug was fixed in chips by early 1976, so that instruction should work correctly on this board. This unit also has a case, which was a third-party add-on. It appears this may be the same case as featured in the February 1978 issue of Micro Magazine, Made by Enclosures Group of San Francisco, it sold for $23.50. As well as making the unit more attractive, the case reduces the likelihood of dropping liquids or something conductive onto the board and damaging it. The unit was working when I received it. It came with the two edge connectors with power wires. I did some minor cleaning of the case and installed it using screws. I've ordered some third-party expansion boards that provide RS-232 serial interfaces and memory expansion, 
These will allow using the serial and cassette tape interfaces and running programs like 2KSA that require more than the built-in 1K of RAM. I plan to cover these in future videos. The Kim 1 was significant in that it was the first affordable single board computer and played a large role in starting the personal computer revolution. Original Kim 1 computers are not extremely rare but are somewhat collectible. If you want to try out the Kim 1 and don't own one, there are a number of simulators available. Brielle Computers also sells the Micro Kim, a Kim 1 computer replica. This is the first book I owned on the 6502 and was aimed at the Kim 1 and taught me 6502 machine language programming, although I did not own a Kim 1 at the time. I've created a small quick reference for the Kim 1 that lists commands, memory map, key addresses and ROM routines, and the connector pinouts. It can be found on GitHub along with other Kim 1 and 6502 software that I work on. A Google search will identify many Kim 1 and 6502 related sites on the internet. The original Kim 1 manuals are all available, for example, as well as the first book of Kim and copies of hobbyist magazines of the time. Here are just a few references that I found useful. I hope you enjoyed this look at a piece of computing history. If so, you may be interested in my other YouTube videos on retro computing and vintage electronics.